as we continue our conversations with presidential candidates. So yesterday, we had here the CPP's uh, presidential candidate. She passed through on a holiday, especially as it was marking Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. What's in the past, some of us have known to be founder, apostrophe S, Founders Day. But today we interact with another one of the presidential candidates. We sit with the 10th presidential candidate on the ballot as he rallies voter support and articulates his vision for Ghana. Actually, he is number 11 on uh, the ballot, just two steps away from Alan Kwejo uh, Tremartin. He joins the conversation this morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. It's good to have you join us in the studio. I'd just like you to share your thoughts with us, share with all of the Ghanaians watching, those in Ghana and beyond. Who is George Chum Berima Edu? Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and good morning to all Ghanaians watching and listening. My name is George Chum Berima Edu. I am the third child of Mr. and Mrs. Edu. I hail from Achim Tafo. I did my primary school at Garrison Elementary and then my secondary school at Presec. And from there, I did my first and master's degree at Florida International University, after which I came down to Ghana in 1993. I served at the Insurance Commission. After there, I left and did my own private work, where I've been since I went on retirement August of 2023. Okay, so since that time, I mean, since the year 2000 thereabouts, you went into private enterprise, and since that time, what have you been up to? I mean, you've, you've done a number of things. Tell us a bit about that, before you decided to get into politics and be a candidate. I mainly am a, um, a game into, I'm an enthusiast. I, from when I left government in 2001, April, I formed a company with, with, with a friend, entry and we set up a game company called Fun Games okay. and we basically converted the Ghana Highway Code into a card game. The Ghana Highway Code? Yes, into a card game. We, we, we realized that drivers were basically learning the Highway Code just to pass the exams and after that they don't, they don't, visit, they don't go back to it. So my friend Sam Entry and myself got the idea to convert the Highway Code into a card game and after you've played the whole card game, basically you have read the Highway Code. And it was adopted by DVLA. Then it was called VELD. Um, and when you go and apply for a driver license, they give it to you. It was called Road User Playing Cards. Mm. And after that, we did a board game from the card game. and was used by state transport from um, up to, I think, um, 2000 and two or so was used by, by state transport. From there also, I, I authored a book during the time of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic called Behavior Brings Success. It is now in the fourth edition. Okay. It's been quite successful. And then also, I, my friends and I also formed another company called Dominion Games Limited, where we were doing games for the, the uh, digital platform. So we have one popular game right now online called Word Meets Tea. It is basically a word game like Scrabble with okay. a golf twist. So I've been there in the game industry since 2001 till I left to <clears throat> do what I'm doing now. So you're, you're essentially an entrepreneur, a businessman, and you have quite a bit of an investment pool in Ghana. That is very true. Okay, and just an interesting question before we get into, since you've brought all of this up, gaming and all that, I am curious, you want to be president if, you know there's a betting tax, 10% on winnings. I'm sure the bettors would be very excited about this. What do you think about that tax? I think, um, so first is income. I don't think it's a problem, there's a problem with it. I think when we make our income, we have to pay government their due. The issue, I don't think, is the tax per se. It's what government does with the tax they collect. Okay. I, believe that, I believe that if we see something from the tax government collects, we, we will not have a problem with the government taxing us. So I don't think the problem with the betting tax, I think that 10% is a bit too high to start with, maybe 5% to start with, to see how the modalities work. 
before we increase if there is need to increase. Other than that, I don't see a problem with it. I will bring it down to between 3 and 5%. 3 and 5%. You'll still tax it, but you'll do between 3 and 5%. And the tax income will be used properly. Okay. Let's come back. And, and that was just by... And by just, the by, and just, because you, just you about started games. on the on that gaming front, so I just wanted to. It just occurred to me. I wanted to pick you. No, but just to talk about answer. games. I mean, um, I was watching this Joy Sports Invitational, and I was just thinking, if Joy Sports Invitational can invite all the candidates, or thirty of us somehow, to get involved, the presidential candidates. Yes, I mean, it would mm. be a good idea for fitness. Well, well I guess this is this is free, um, some sort of consultancy and a proposal. So one of the, the independent or the presidential candidates is pushing for this. Maybe I'll run it by the sports team and see. Uh, for, for as many of you as are willing uh, yes. to come through. But you have already thrown your hat in. I, I'm all for sports in any form of um, exercise. Mm. I'll come to you later on sports since you are an aficionado, a fan, especially because of where uh, stadia are, right? But I'll save that for later. Let's talk about George Chumberi Medu. Why do you want to be president? I think it is, at the moment, it is quite obvious that after 32 years of NDC MPP, we've gone backwards. I mean, we have basically gone backwards. There is no two way about that. And it is only a candidate who is not packed it back. The issue is that, you see, MPP and NDC, because of the nature of how it is structured, it is a, they are from a political background party base. And political parties, the way they are structured, cannot develop countries. They, are, they basically exist to win elections. They, they, been, they are structured, their form is to win elections. So when they come to power, they don't do anything for the people. They, what they do is how to work to win the next election. So after 32 years, it becomes obvious that it hasn't helped our democracy, hasn't helped Ghana. And it's time we look for a candidate who doesn't have any ties to a political party, whose ties are to the people of Ghana and to Ghana as a whole. Who can, can, can we find someone like that who has no ties to the NDC or the MPP? Is that realistic? I'm sure in your lifetime in Ghana, you voted at a point for either the NDC or the MPP before becoming... Uh, you know, opting to be a presidential candidate. It, that, is it practical to say that is very people who true. are totally I have, off from these two? That things? is very true. I have voted NDC. I have voted NPP. I voted, I, I probably vote on manifestos. Okay. I believe when I was a kid, um, I was telling my dad, then, then I was in Presec, and we used to queue for everything before the May 15th, uh, June, June 4th coup. And during the elections of um, Liman and Victor Wu. So I remember saying to my dad, no, I can't vote, but if I'll vote, I'll vote for Liman. And my dad got so upset. And I said, because Liman is saying that in 100 days, no more queue. Then we're queuing for everything. We were queuing for soap, omo, toilet paper. And my point to my dad was that my, Liman said in 100 days, no more queues. I don't want to queue for, for items. For these essentials. Yeah, so right. if I am voting, I'll vote for Liman. I vote manifesto, and that is what I look at. Unfortunately, the parties don't follow their manifestos. Mm. They just write them so nice and so beautiful. When they get to power, they do what a political party will do. So it's true. I have voted NDC, I have voted MPP, but I am not a card-carrying member of either MPP or NDC. Mm. I vote because I believe that I had the hope that these two parties have the gun at heart. And when they come, they will do what is best for Ghana and for Ghanaians. Unfortunately, like I said before, they replaced the head of state portion of the constitution mm. with head of party. And when they come to power, they think only of their party members, those who voted for them. So, so in essence, when we have a president, it's not head of state, it's head of party. Yeah, the constitution says that there will be a president who will be head of state, head of government, and commander in chief of the armed force of Ghana but they replace the head of state portion with head of party. That is why the current president will say, because you didn't vote for me, I won't, I won't do you any favors. Mm. That is why um, both NDC and MPP will launch a program and will paste their party colors on it. That is why we'll have a state event and you will see party colors, because they replace the head of state with head of party. 
What Ghana now needs is someone who truly shall be head of state for Ghana and for all of Ghanaians. That is why I believe that this is the time for Ghana and Ghanaians to look for a candidate who is not backed by a political party. Okay, so let's talk about a quick thing before we get back to, you, you don't have a party, so to speak. You're, you're an independent candidate. And that brings to mind the recent balloting at the Electoral Commission. Let me ask your initial thoughts. How did you find it? I mean, I don't know whether it's magic number 11. I don't know whether you were, would you have wanted, for example, a general pool where all of you are thrown in and you do it, or this bit about the independent candidates after the party candidates have come, then you come in, and the whole bit about, oh, someone picked this and handed it to somebody else. How did you find the entire process before we talk about whether you are content with your number 11? I believe that the EC said they will look at it going forward, which they have to. Because, I, because the day I went for my nomination form, that is, I think, 2nd August, and all of us, all 39 of us, went for the same passcode that would give you, that, that you would download the nomination form. And the nomination form says, presidential candidate nomination form 2024. It didn't say a party nomination form 2024. It referred to all of us as presidential candidates. So when it comes to the balloting, it has to be the same. Mm. All candidates who have qualified for the balloting should be in the same port. But the EC said they've had it, and they've taken it into, um, in, I mean, they will take it into consideration. Uh, to consider consideration going forward for the next, um, the next. So you were not content with that that strategy. I didn't agree. I didn't agree with it at all. But again, because they said they've had it, and going forward they will take, they will make some changes. I think it's not a bad idea. But see, the main problem is this: because we don't go to IPAC, the independent candidates. Thank you. It's the parties that thank go to you. IPAC, and, the, and, and then other representatives. Thank you. And the, and I believe these decisions are taken at IPAC. So it is the parties that go to IPAC, and the parties will vote in their favor. But this shouldn't come to IPAC. My simple point again is that we all pick the same presidential nomination form. And for that matter, we are all presidential candidates. But mm. I like my number 11 a lot. I went there, I, I said to God, the number that you know that when you put me on, I shall win the election, is what I asked for. I didn't go there with any number in mind. One, two, 13, no, 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 no. Where God knows where he puts me, I will win. And I believe that where God made me, the number he made me select, which is number 11 mm. on the ballot paper, is where God knows that I will win the election. Which I, I believe see. seem to be true. Uh, you know, the NDC and the MPP, uh, there's been a sort of astrological game played with the numbers they picked, number eight, um, and their meanings, uh, number one and its meanings, even some number 13. You know, in the United States, some people will stay away from the number 13 because of superstition. But in other jurisdictions, it has a positive meaning. Have you, I mean, read anything into the number 11? I don't. Like I said, I pray to God. I said to God, let your will be done. Where you know that you put me, I shall win the election. So I have not put any... Um, any connotation or twist to it. But I'll say this, uh, one of my team members called me and said he was called by someone who said, you know, you're the one to 13. Only one number was a master number in the field of numerology. I don't do those, I mean, I don't go to that, that area. And the person was telling him that your master, I mean, that is your, your PC, pick the master number, which is the master number which is 11, so I believe your PC is the one who shall win the election. And I was saying to my, uh, my aide, my colleague, that, well, other than going to those fields, I pray to God, and I know that the number that I picked on my 11 is what God want, wants to give to me, and I know again that is what God shall use for me to win the election. As a candidate, I mean, you launched your manifesto. Uh, this is many, many months ago. I launched my, I launched my campaign. My manifesto, your campaign, actually. My manifesto yes. is, is chapter six of the, of, of the Constitution. Right. You launched your campaign, actually. You're right, at uh, Osu. Osu, yes. Right, Presby. Now, you're saying the Constitution is essentially your manifesto? 
chapter 6 of the Constitution. That is the directive principles, principles of state, state policy. policy. And I believe that everybody, if you get a chance, please read chapter 6 of the Constitution. It is the generic blueprint for the country. And I don't see why parties do constitutions. Everything is in there. And if the party follows it, we won't have a problem that we are right now. Everything is in there. Everything concerning the development of Ghana and the Ghanaian is in that section of the Constitution. And if the parties just follow it. So when I read, I said, look, this is what I'm going to do for Ghana. I'm going to implement fully and totally what chapter 6 of the Constitution says. Because it is all there. Let's, I want to, us to quickly get into the 1992 Constitution and look at the directive principles of state uh, policy. I, I have it somewhere here. Since you've mentioned it, I want us to get into it. But what are the crucial areas uh, that you're focusing on when it comes to the directive it principles talks, of state policy? Chapter 6. Of yeah, the, in uh, Article, Article 6, of it, it, it talks about balance and even development across every section of the country. Balance and even development. And if we can only do that, we will not have what we have today in terms of the I'm saying. Currently, as we speak, we have... Um, and Galam says is an issue I would have gotten to, so let's, let's go there. Yeah, so if, <clears throat> if they just execute a balanced and even development across every section, all the districts, I have taught all the districts of, of, I mean, of the country, only five I couldn't tour because of then there were some issues there in terms of security. Mm. And I've done the whole country a second time. So if only the, 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 the two main parties will just implement Article 36 of the Constitution. The issue of Galamse, the issue of all the uh, crime, the issue of the poverty, will all be a thing of the past. It is one area where I will focus a lot to ensure balance and even development across the whole country. And it's key in my agenda as part of uh, my policy statement, which, which, which I shall release sometime later next month. OK. And you believe this will suffice to streamline all these areas, the, the, the areas of our national economy, national life, taxes, and all of that, the economy. You believe just focusing on this will settle that without bringing through. And let me, let me paint examples for you. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, for example, of the MPP, says, He's going to create jobs. He's going to go digital even more. That he's going to ensure that the youth have IT skills and that they can compete and compare with people from other parts of the world. You have a John Dramani Mahama telling you he will, like, he will do same, that he will create one million jobs in IT. Uh, both of them seem to resonate on that. That he knows how to bring the economy out of the doldrums. He's been there and he knows how to handle it. He talks about the 24-hour economy. These are policy frameworks that you can say fall into that bucket, but they have couched something concrete for them, from them. I mean, chapter six of the Constitution. Why are you not doing same? Some would say just leaving it based on chapter six like that in itself is not enough. Chapter six is very deep. It, it, it talks about the economic, social, political, <coughs> all aspects of the country. But before I go there, you mentioned Mahama, I mean, the former president Mahama and the current vice president, Mahmoud Baumia, both talking about one million jobs. And yeah. I, asked, I, 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 mean, I was asking- In, in IT, IT-related yes, right. I was jobs. asking, I went to campaign somewhere and I was asking them, why one million? Why does MPP and DC always speak about only one million? What about the other seven, eight million Ghanaian or youth that <coughs> are also there? Because they are party based. When they say one million, they talk only about their members, not about really? Ghana. That, that is why they say one million, not about, not about the rest of Ghana. They're talking about their members, their youthful members who are just one million. I'm, I'm a former President Mahama, the, the current Vice President uh, Mahmoud Bahumia, always says one million jobs, one million this, one million that. Why always only one million? But they are focusing on IT. That is just one aspect of the entire economy. You think only one million people in, one, I mean, I mean uh, one IT in Ghana, they are more than the, I am in that industry. Why don't you just say you will create, create a platform 
Anybody else who wants to be in IT, anybody yeah. else who wants to be anything, can just go in there and use it. So back to the point of um, uh, specifics. I have, as part of my program, like I said earlier on, the issue of the two parties in the last 32 years has been that they are focused solely and totally on economic growth, trying to please the IMF and the World Bank and their development partners. So you hear a party saying that our finance minister, our president from 92 till today, even last week, our, our, our finance minister was saying it, that the economy has grown at this percentage. That doesn't bring about development. We've gone through mills, 14% growth. It was the highest in the world, yet we were poorer. Mm. So the parties have failed in that respect because they, they concentrate on only one aspect, economic growth. But when we look at chapter 36, six, sorry. Chapter 6. Six, it talks about economic growth and the growth of the human person. I mean, without growing the... I mean, um, the Ghanaian, the human being, the development of the Ghanaian, which is key. So this is what I say. If the, develop, the developmental fundamentals are weak, it is not the exchange rate that would expose you. It is the rural to urban overseas drift and the illegal activities being done by the youth to survive that would expose you. That's what we have today. And we have a lot of that. That's the what we have to do. rural urban migration is rural. still going on. Right a now, brain drain of a lot of Ghanaian youth, you know, going right out. Right now, it has, it has turned. Now, there are more people in the urban than in the rural. It's 60 40 now. Mm. Urban to rural. When in 1992, it was 37%, 73. Rural urban. Now, it has gone the other way. It's because every government since Rollins has followed economic growth and has left development. Without development of the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian, I mean, Ghana can grow as big and as large as ever economically in terms of GDP, mm. but we will still be poorer as a people. So maybe, people. maybe that is why, that is why we seem to be developing the economy, so to speak, but in terms of the real developments of the individual in Ghana and why maybe the GDP will be getting better and then we'll be talking about the macroeconomy, but in terms of the, the ordinary Ghanaian's pocket, not much is there. And you still be, but now, now I'm buying orange at five cities, one orange. Mm. So that, that, so but what can you do about that? So, if, if you're I, so I am coming with, I say let us break the two. These two parties currently are our problem. I said, let us break the two. I'm calling all Ghanaians to join the cause with me to break the two, because these two parties don't have a solution. What they have are their party members, and their party members alone cannot solve Ghana's problem. It is the whole of Ghana, you, me, and everybody, including both MPP and DC supporters, who will solve the problem. So let us break these two parties, I'm all going to join the cause. And what I have for Ghana is common prosperity. Common prosperity means that it is everybody being lifted. If the richer, if you are rich, you'll be made richer. If you are poor, you'll be made rich. Every, so my policies, if you come in policies, they are geared towards common prosperity for all. Okay. It I'll, is developing. I'll, I'll, I'll come shortly to that common prosperity for, for all. Just give me the understanding. Breaking the two, I mean, we've heard of breaking the eight. Now it's become a bit because some other party has got eight, and I, I don't care what numbers and how they play with them, but your breaking the two means you want to break the, the dominance of the MPP and the NDC. Yes, that that's what me, you mean. but Ghanaians together. We can do it. We, we made MPP and NDC. They didn't make themselves. We made them. Mm. It is you and I and all Ghanaians who have voted all these years for MPP and NDC. And it is us who can also break the duopoly. So do, we are, do you think Ghanaians are ready for that? I believe that Ghanaians... Because we've had interactions with some 
you know, stalwarts in the political space, and they will say, listen, it's going to take a long time, just like in the U.S., for any other party to break the dominance of the two I in Ghana. I believe there's a very um, a silent majority out there. During my tours across the country, I've been to, I mean, I've been to villages, I mean, I've been to areas across the country. I have sat at with people. I mean, and when I start talking about politics, they say, what's that? Jai, stop. Yeah, MPP, MPP, and so on. No, 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 I'm not MPP or NEC. I'm coming to me now, me back as independence. Oh, okay, then it's yes. We don't want to hear MPP or, or I mean, or NDC. I'm going to buy 10 BR, they come every four years, they promise and then they go, we don't see them again. There is a majority out there that is silent. And I'm saying to Ghanaians that they will see that majority rise on December 7th. All we, you and I must do is join them. We can do it. You know, if you go to the Bible, right? So this is a silent majority. There is a silent, I mean, everywhere I went. And I, I mean, I start my days from 6 a.m. I come back around 10 p.m. And I move, I move, I move to the villages. I sit down with them house to house. I, we talk about their issues, the farmers, the traders. I mean, I spent a lot of time with them. And they tell you that, if it was MPP and DC, please don't sit and go. That's no, 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 I'm not MPP and DC. So you feel the people are tired, genuinely yeah. tired of these two? People are genuinely tired. They were asking me, but why, but why, but why? And I said, okay, what can you say? If you say, oh, Baba Boye, you know, if you, if you come to help all of us, then we are with you. We say, come on, prosperity, you know, then we are with you. We believe because when you're NDC or, I'm not MPP. And that's, what has, and that's what gave me the courage. And it, be, and it became even evident more when I was going around again doing, I mean, for my endorsers. It was very Of course, simple. you had to go to yes, the different... every district. It was very, it was very easy for me mm. because I've been with them already. And they said, yeah, Taiwachi, we are with you. We are going to back you to ensure that you, you come and liberate us from these two parties. So you are certain that this time, against the the tide against what since 2000, especially, you know, just once you've had a, a blip of the smaller political parties exceeding about 3%. That is a blip that has happened only once. And since then, it's been a whitewash. The smaller parties have not been able to do anything. So I have two quick questions for you. You think an independent candidate, you, could become president in election 2024. But how do you feel about the smaller parties coming together? One, not that I think, I believe, I truly believe that this election year is going to be different. Because like I said, not that they say, I have, I have heard it myself, I've gone around everywhere and I have heard it. I believe, I believe, I believe that this year is going to be very, very different. Ghanaians are cross board, are just tired. You are, I mean, it all. We are tired. We are mm. afraid of these two parties. They've taken us for a ride for too long, 32 years, and it took, it took China just 31 years to move from third world to first world, 31 years. We have Singapore, gone, we've, we've also, gone bankrupt. I mean, mm. So it is something which, it is something which Ghanaians are not yearning for. With the smaller parties coming together, it is something which I've been asked a few times. And I believe that, I don't want to say it here, but I believe those smaller parties know why they are formed. So I don't believe in us or me per se joining them because I believe that everyone has their own agenda and plan. Mm. Mine is to implement Article, sorry, Chapter six. six of the Constitution fully and totally. I see. They have theirs. Mm. Mine, is, mine is to bring common prosperity for every Ghanaian across board, irrespective of where you are. So my policies are all geared towards that. All my policies are geared towards common prosperity for everyone. Tell us how you're going to execute this common prosperity. That is what Ghanaians have been calling for. Everybody wants to be prosperous, yeah? But if it were that simple, uh, I believe the NDC and the MPP would have done it by now. If it has not been achieved, what makes you think you can achieve it? It is very simple, but uh, two parties basically have an agenda not to keep us poorer so that they will come and give us money every four years to take our vote. It is that simple. So if you don't have a party agenda, 
when you are going to make any, any decision, you do it purely and ask yourself, how will it benefit Ghanaians? So my first policy, which is Ghana first within cost. Ghana first within cost is to ensure that everything is being done by Ghana. It benefits Ghana. So I will reimagine, I mean, we will reimagine every sector of the economy to ensure that is it benefiting Ghana? Are Ghanaians benefiting? And how can we ensure that it is, we are benefiting and it's benef benefiting Ghana? Two, is it within cost? Is the cost something that it is within our budget or is being bloated? Like mm. I said before, Procurement is because that's where the devil is. Procurement. Thank you very much. Procurement is where the devil is. So when we look at it, it makes sure that it is it benefits Ghana and the Ghanaian, and it is within cost. That would be a key policy across all government sectors. That is one. Two. My other policy of domestic um, district contracts for the youth. So many contracts go to the district, but when they go, it goes with the company's name already on it, and that company has no link to the district. So you see that people in that district don't benefit and they end up moving, move, moving from there to the, dis, the city. So with district contracts for the youth, every contract that goes to the districts is going to be for the people in that district that qualify to execute the contract. If you qualify, you form cooperatives, it is yours. It is meant to ensure that we spread wealth across every district. It's meant to ensure that we develop the, the economy of every district because those that live in there, if they have the money, they will stay in there, they will build that district, and they will develop that district. The other one I have is DDI, Domestic Direct Investment. Since 92, every government since Rollins, when they come FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, they spend all resources and trips abroad to get foreigners to come here and invest, and none, no one has done, no government has done it anything for the Ghanaian investor who struggles day and night to build Ghana. We are the only ones who will build our country. So I am coming up with domestic direct investment and a whole fund will be established for... When you say fund, what do you mean? I know the Norwegians have this fund for future generations generated from oil, wealth and all of that. What kind of fund so are you contributing? We have the domestic direct investment fund where anyone who is living in Ghana, using 70% Ghana, Ghana raw materials for their end product, can access that fund for cheap money, not a bank, not a bank rate that is so high, for their, um, their company or their factory. It is to make Ghanaians or anyone living in You're Ghana... You're telling me if someone is processing cassava, for example, maybe cassava farmer who is also processing uh, it for God, and, and we know there are so many yes. products and byproducts of it. Such a person doesn't have to go to a bank for a loan at twenty something, thirty percent. What what they can access the fund so far as they are using so far as seventy percent of their raw materials for that end product is it's from, from Ghana. Ghana. How it, will you do this without the banks? Where will you get the money from? Government has so many access to money. One of the things that, like I said, so far as one of my friends at Ministry of Finance told me, George, you know, if you can plug just 20% of the wastage, you make, we can save so much money. If we've we've heard that rhetoric before. It is, it, is, it, is the, it is the will to do it. That's where the problem is. You remember Yeti Castle? Yes, but it's the will. If you, if you look at the government travel budget, it's over $500 million a year. That's over half a billion dollars a year they spend to travel. If you can check that. There are so many areas we can spend, we can save money for the fund to help Ghanaian businesses to develop in the district. My other one is um, ISICA. 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 Basically, I'm going to abolish or repeal E levy and bring ISICA. ISICA is very simple and very, and, and very basic, it is a savings plan for all Ghanaians. When it's, we, we, one, one thing we all do every day is we spend money. We all spend money. We buy a word, we buy some, we spend money daily. If you spend, so far as you spend, a little percentage will go into your ECC savings account tied to your Ghana, Ghana card account. It is your own money. So every day you are saving. Every day you are saving. At the age of 60, 
So the ECK fund will be, I mean, account which is your money, will be apportioned to three. One, one part pension, one part housing, one part welfare. The pension is when you are 60, with all the investment and the, all the interest is given to you. The housing is it's given to you as part of your other pension, your, other your pension. SNIT. It doesn't, re, it doesn't come to replace SNIT, it's, it's, it's in addition. The housing is for you to take, to go and own your own house. One thing that my own government wants to do is for Ghanaians to have their own home, their own house, that they call their own, and stop paying you rent. And then the last one, welfare, every 12 months, it's paid to you. You can use it for anything you want to use it for, whether for education, travel, it's your money. But every day you are saving. That's how we grow wealth. We, make, we help you to save. We, so whenever you are spending money, if you go to bed at night, oh, today I have saved. And the moment the money hits your account, you will, it will be an, uh, an, an, but, an... That would also mean this will be contingent on how much the person is spending, right? That is, that Which is, would mean that the, the big spenders will earn more and the little spenders will earn less. But and it, someone who is spending... 50 CDs a day in a way that would go through the system over how long would it take such a person to earn anything? But one, without this, you don't have saved anything. And two, because it's been, it's been invested for you. It's so compound added. interest. It is still, it is still, yes. So at the end of the day, at the end, I mean, when, so for the first time under this policy, every Ghanaian will have pension. For the first time, every Ghanaian will have pension. Because so far as you spend, you are saving, it's tied to your, your, your Ghana card account. So every Ghanaian will have pension. When you are 60, the money is given to you in a lump sum. And you are still spending. So you are still saving. So the, the, my, my other one is um, my agri for wealth policy. You know, my agri for wealth policy is something which I believe that Ghana, Ghana, ha, I mean, Ghana needs. I said to the farmers when I met them in Avrongo, that my grandfather, Papa Champo, my grandfather, my, my mother's father, my mother's father, father was a cocoa farmer who took his kids, at least four or five of them, to school in the UK, to school in the UK. He held their hands, went to that Otaka report to board a boat and went to the UK. And today as we speak, I don't know how many farmers can do that. And this Agri for Wealth policy is to ensure that every Ghanaian farmer, they are able to make wealth from their farming. Mm. They're able to send their kids. And, and, and this, and, and this includes all those in the agri space, that mm. is fishermen, poultry farmers, and all of that. And able to send their kids to the best schools in the country or abroad, as my grandfather was able to do. OK. In the next few minutes, I want us to address a few issues very quickly, and then we shall take it from there. You are running as a presidential candidate, independent. You don't have members of parliament. Uh, you don't have any people standing in that regard. Uh, just recently, Justice Jones Doche was saying that, look, we should opt either for a pure presidential system or a pure parliamentary system and stop this thing about picking people from parliament and making them ministers and then cabinet members and all of that. How do you hope to govern? Let's say Ghanaians vote for you. How are you going to govern when likely most of the members of parliament will be on the MPP and NDC tickets? This question I'm asked a lot when I meet the press. And I keep on saying always that it is not a difficult issue at all. The framers of the constitution were very, very smart in their thinking. They said a certain majority, I mean, a certain number maximum will be cabinet, not more than 19. And out of that, a majority will come from parliament. So let's say 10, right? The majority. They didn't say it must come from party A or party B. It is the MPP and the NDC who has caused this problem that when they get to power, they take only from their members in parliament. The constitution never said it must come from party A or party B. It said it must come. From parliament. Mm. So to me, so far as you are a parliamentarian, Benjamin or your team members, so far as you are a parliamentarian, and you qualify to serve in my government, I will go for you. That is what the law says. But, but the law doesn't restrict you though. You can pick people outside of parliament who do qualify to be members of parliament. Not, not, you can pick people not, from said, outside of parliament who ordinarily 
per the constitution, would have qualified to stand as members of parliament. He said, it's, no, he said in so cabinet no more than 19, but mm. a majority of that must come from parliament. Mm. So I'm here to, uh, talking only about the cabinet aspect, which is like 10, 10, 10 in maximum must come from parliament by my, by my calculation. But it didn't limit it to party A or party B. He said parliament. So to me, so far as a parliamentarian, I, I can choose you to be in my own government. It is for the committee in parliament, the appointment committee, to say they won't agree or they will agree. So I, I, that is not a problem at all. And I want all Ghanaians to not see, see, see it as a problem at all because there is, no, there is no parliamentarian, I believe, who will refuse to serve. Okay. Do you, are, are you going to have a running mate anytime soon? Yes, I have a running mate, and Ghana, I mean, the best running mate I, I, I'll say to Ghanaians, he's a development consultant, and it, and it was a very good reason why I took him, because development of the Ghanaian is key to me. And I would, have you outdoored him yet? I would, I, hopefully, I'm early next month. Early next month. Yes, he's okay. a, a, a wonderful Ghanaian, a Kumasi boy, um, but he, from the north. <clears throat> I see a trend where, for example, Ala Chemating going for one of my friends. You're going for young blood as running mates. I don't know whether it's a trend, but it's an interesting and heartwarming uh, trend, actually. Before I take your final message, we spoke, I've not forgotten, about sports stadia and all that. We don't have the time, but I'd like to find out, um, looking at the state of our stadia, for which reason now we have to look outside, and I hear the Togolese are even refusing to allow us to use their stadia. I believe it's a shame. What is your take on that? And uh, do you believe in this call for an auditing of the voters' register? After that, we'll take our final comments. It, with regards to the voters' regi register, this, this is my, my belief. I believe that there has to be a process where every, before every election, no matter the party or government or, pe or person in power, the voters' register has to be audited before election. Like, it has to be standard, automatic. So, so that all this back and forth is taken up. You know, when MDC was in power, when Mahama was in power, MPP was calling for it. Mm. And now it is reversed. I believe that there has to be a standard where no matter the party in power, it has to be automatic. You do the register, it's audited, and then we all pass it. So you, so you are for an audit? Now, no, my policy is that Every four years, it has to be audited. It has to be audited. Not like now, but every four years, automatically it has to be audited. But then that means you are for an audit. No. Especially with the problems that have been raised. No, 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 no. My policy is simple. The policy must be in place. Mm. That every four years, there, there must be an audit. audit. Okay. Right. Because what happened last four years, is not ha is, sorry, last eight years, is happening again. With regards to this, uh, the stadium, it is sad that a football nation like Ghana, under an MPP or NDC government, we don't have one single stadium where, where we can play a CAF or FIFA match. Mm. And it tells you that Ghana, for, for the, and this comes to, to what I keep saying, that it is time to break the two. It is time to let go of these two parties so that we can have a government that will actually think about Ghana and Ghanaians. Okay. You know, so it is sad that we, we don't have a single stadium that can host a game that we have to go outside of Ghana. And this alone should say to Ghanaians that it is time to move from these two parties, move from these two parties, and look at George Chum Berima Edu for president. Okay, all right. So the final thing I want you to do for us, we want peace in Ghana in 2024. We have something we've started. The hashtag is ChoosePeaceGH. I want you to look right into that camera over there, your camera and give us a peace message in just about 40 seconds to one minute. What is your message of peace for us, for Ghanaians? Okay. My message of peace to all Ghanaians is that we, this is the only country we have. We have no other country. At least, this is the only country I have. And I believe that is for this, I mean, um, it's the same for so many other Ghanaians. And so it is in our interest to ensure that no matter what we do, we we do everything in our power, not, not, not to cause any riot or cause any, any disturbance or allow ourselves to be used by any 
political figures or party for any mischievous activity. We have to also ensure that on election day, we go peacefully, we vote, and we go back to our homes, and we wait for the results to be declared as it's supposed to be. And if we all go through this process, I believe that we will go through this election. God shall give us whom he has willed and chosen and anointed to be our next president. And we will have a country still secured, peaceful, and ready to actually move from third world to first world. This is my message. This is, I am George Chum Berima Edu, number 11 on the ballot paper. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining the conversation. And of course, we wish you the very best with number 11. That is a presidential candidate in election 2024, George Chumberima Edu. He wants to break the two, the duopoly of the MPP and the NDC. Once more, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. We take a breather. We have our very last conversation on the show after the break. Do stay. <laughs>